All right. Now what I'm preaching on this morning, the topic is when to break fellowship. When is it appropriate to break fellowship with people? Now, what we see here, I'm just going to dive right in. In Romans 16, of course, the first part of Romans 16, there's a lot of salutations, a lot of greetings, a lot of, hey, say, say hi to this person. Say, yeah, you know, these people helped me out. This person worked with me. These are really good people. Uh, you know, and basically what he's doing is he's marking by name individuals that are really good people. They're good Christians. They're helpful. The workers, you know, say hi to them, greet them, give them a kiss, tell them, you know, tell them I love them, tell them I'm thinking about them. So I'm praying for him. And he's specifically mentioning many, many people that he cares about. And then as he finishes up that list, verse number 17 here in Romans 16, the Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So after he just gets done with this whole list, he's saying, Now you need to mark, you need to mark out the people that are causing the problems, that are trying to create divisions within the church, that are trying to go in and split people up and just call and stir up a lot of trouble. He says you need to mark them, which means you identify them. And just as he identified these people by name, you could call out these other people by name that are just causing problems. He says mark them and avoid them. When you avoid someone, you're not having anything to do with them. You are breaking fellowship with a person that's going to come in and try to cause division, that's trying to cause problems in the church. Now, let me be clear about this, because someone who's causing division is not the same as someone who might have a, a difference of opinion about certain scriptures or might believe or see things a different way. We're not commanding everybody to believe every single thing all exactly the same and that if you don't get in lockstep with every single thing, then you're out of here, buddy. No, you are allowed to think for yourself. You have your own beliefs. But what we don't want you doing is going around trying to split the church because this church has established beliefs. We have doctrines that we believe here. And if you don't believe, especially the core doctrines of this church, then this isn't the church for you. So rather than go around and trying to tell everybody why all of your doctrines are wrong, the best thing to do is just to go somewhere else. Find the church that does have those beliefs and go and join that church. Because you're not going to be welcome here if you just go around trying to tell everybody why you know, the established doctrines are wrong within the church. Because all you're doing at that point is causing divisions and offenses. It says, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. So the Apostle Paul is specifically mentioning, saying, hey, if these people are coming up trying to split you on this doctrine that you've already received, that you've already learned of him, mark them, avoid them, have nothing to do with them. And it says in verse 18, for they that are such, so those types of people, serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. What will often happen with these types of people, not in every case for sure, but what oftentimes will happen is that people will try to cause divisions and split people up. It says with good words and fair speeches. So they're going to they're gonna use you know, persuasion of good words and telling you things that are going to sound good to your ears, but aren't true. See, oftentimes the truth hurts. Oftentimes you're going to hear things preached from the Bible that people don't want to hear. But it's true. We have a lot of established doctrines that we believe in this church that the world is going to reject. The world's going to say we're hateful. The world's going to say that, you know, you shouldn't believe that, that you're wrong and, and whatever. And that's fine. The world can believe what the world's going to believe what they want to believe because the world is, is of the world, not of the Father. And you expect that. But that's out in the world that should not be happening within church. And if you know someone that is especially prone to causing problems, like I said, you can, you know, I'm fine. People have discussions. You love the Bible. You talk about the Bible. You see things differently. You can, you can talk to each other. Fine. Fine, that's great. I encourage it. I think, that's, I think that's great for people to be talking about Bible and you're excited about it and you learn about it, but there's a difference between having that difference of opinion someone coming up to you 
and just trying to teach you something, you know, coming up to you and trying to, to cause problems and teaching doctrine that's contrary to what you know the church believes. This has already happened in other like-minded churches. It's been happening all throughout history. It's going to continue to happen. There's going to be people that come in with an evil intent. intent. They're going to look like they're, oh, I'm just, I'm just being, um, you know, they're going to try to appear to be harmless. And they're going to try to play the, the sympathy card. And, oh, no, uh, you know, you're just, you're seeing something that's not really there or whatever. But when people come in and try to teach you doctrine that's contrary, they are coming in to, to, to cause division. And they need to be marked and avoided. So those are the types of people, that's one instance. Turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 3 of people that we need to break fellowship with. Now, oftentimes, you'll see a characteristic of people, too, where you can have these red flags pop up. And when you see someone who's continually on the wrong side of issues, and what I mean by that, that meaning that the type of people that, that want to be so loving that they're more loving than Jesus Christ himself, that they're more loving than God's commandments, and they're more loving than, than what the Bible actually says, Watch out for people like that. People always want to sympathizing with the most wicked people in the world and just want to take it easy on everybody. Watch out for those people. Because they're probably not, they're definitely not established in their faith. And they may be unsaved in, in, in just trying to cause problems anyway. So there's people that pop up like that, it seems like, on a regular basis. Now, in Titus chapter 3, we're going to go over various types of people that we should be breaking fellowship with and avoiding. And this goes to not just within the church, but, you know, these days with the internet, if you know someone is a heretic, then you ought to have nothing to do with those people. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse number 9. The Bible says, but avoid foolish questions. Avoid. Again, your means you're having nothing to do with them. I, don't want to, I, I want to avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law for they are unprofitable and vain. So look at those last two words, you know, the contentions and the strivings about the law. These are people that are coming in and what are they doing? They're causing divisions that are contrary to the doctrine. That's why they're, they're wanting to fight about this. They want to argue with you. They want to, to fight about the law, about what God's word says. And then it says in verse 10, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. One of the attitudes that we need to make sure we're not falling into is the, the sense that, oh, well, I, could, I can break this person of their heresy, right? If you have a heretic, you give them two opportunities. You give them a first admonition, a second admonition, and reject. Now, we apply this oftentimes to going out sowing, and I think it's a very good application when you go out and try to preach the gospel to somebody to not get involved in some big debate. You know, if they're caught up in some false religion, you try to show them, okay, let's show you once, let's show you twice. All right, I'm out of here. But you, can, you should also not just be applying this to try, you know, preaching the gospel. But if you know someone to be a heretic, you know someone, whether, you know, in person or online or whatever, and you know that they're teaching heresy. And again, teach, being a heretic and teaching heresy is different than seeing some things a little bit differently. A heretic, let me spell out for you. A heretic is someone that says that Jesus is the Father. They believe in this oneness stuff, that, that deny the, the, who God is. We believe in the Trinity that the Bible is very clear about this. And if you memorize our memory passage, it should be pretty clear in that as well. In John chapter 6, that you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And there are three persons that are part of the one Godhead. And that they are distinct. And they're, yes, they are persons. It's not just a manifestation of one God. That's a, that's a big deal. That's a real big deal. And I haven't covered that a whole lot because I don't think I really need to, but you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep bringing that up, I think, from time to time because that was part of the problem of how it even got crept into some of these churches to begin with is that no one really thought it was a big deal or a big problem. 
There are lots of heretics out there. And you know what? Just as a side note, when you're listening, because I know a lot of us here, you love listening to preaching, you want to grow, you're trying to listen as much as you can out there, and there's a lot of people that you can choose to, to listen to on the internet. I mean, there's just more and more and more and more people that are, that are posting sermons and posting teachings and posting whatever online, and you need to be careful who you choose to listen to. A long time ago, it used to be where people would feel comfortable if someone says, oh, well, I'm King James Bible only, and I'm a Baptist, or I'm King James Bible only, I believe in salvation by grace through faith, and they just say things like that. Okay, they're good to go, and people just run with it. But oftentimes, you have a lot of heretics, a lot of heretics, that are going to look very similar to what's right, but are totally involved in rank heresy. And if you know someone's teaching just total heresy, even on one major point, like the Godhead, you shouldn't be listening to anything that they have to say. I mean, even if they are right about the King James Bible being the Word of God, it doesn't matter. I don't even want to listen to them teach on that subject. I mean, Sam Gipp is right on the King James Bible, but even in his teaching, there's so many things that he uses that are just wrong, bad logical arguments and, and bad arguments altogether, even on that one subject. Before I realized how bad he was, I'd heard and, and read some of his stuff, and it's, and it's horrible. The guy's a heretic. The guy's unsaved. The Bible tells us to avoid the heresy, avoid foolish questions. You don't need to set everybody right. You can try to. You can attempt to, even with the heretic. You give them a couple chances. Well, here's some clear scripture on that. Well, here's some more clear scripture on that. But if they are not going to receive it, then you reject them. Then you just, no, I'm done with you. Then you avoid them. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 7, turn if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 2, Proverbs 14, 7 says, Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Second Timothy chapter two. So who do we avoid? People who come in and try to cause division and trying to cause problems in the church and trying to tell you why what the pastor's preaching is wrong, why what the church believes is wrong. Those are people to be avoided. The heretics whether they're part of the church or not, need to be avoided and rejected. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Look what it says here, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So people who are, who are being profane in what they say and just vain. What's vain babblings? Vain is something that's just basically meaningless. There's just kind of no point. And babbling is, is very similar, right? You typically hear babies babble because they're not using intelligible words. You, go, ah, blah, 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 you know, that's babbling. So when someone's speaking and speaking and speaking with just no value whatsoever, and they're basically saying a bunch of nothing, and they're being profane about it, especially... The Bible says to shun that because that's the only thing that's going to come of that, it's going to increase ungodliness. So just, I don't want to listen to that. Verse number 17, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So here we have the Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy doing exactly what he said for others to do in the book of Romans, to mark them and avoid them. And now he's marking and saying, these are the types of people that you don't want to be around. These are the people you need to shun. And he says, just like Hymenaeus and Philetus, he's marking them for other people to see, hey, don't have anything to do with this person. Don't have anything to do with these people. Verse number 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So these people, they're heretics. That's a serious doctrine saying that the resurrection is already past. That's not some little detail. 
They're saying, nope, the resurrection already happened. It's like this preterist view, and, that's, and it's total heresy to say, oh, yeah, all this stuff has already happened now. We're in the millennium right now, or whatever. That's heresy, and, and according to Apostle Paul, he's saying they're overthrowing the faith of people, and that's a big deal, so they need to be shunned. They need to be rejected. Verse number 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender stripes. Now, let me just make sure I'm clear on this also. Because I'm kind of getting into an area where I said when to break fellowship. If someone comes to you with a foolish question, that doesn't mean you have to break fellowship with that person. I want to make sure I'm not conflating two different things. Okay? We should avoid the foolish question. You don't have to avoid the person necessarily altogether that asks a foolish question. I think everybody at some point asks a foolish question. Okay? That's not what I'm teaching. I just want to make sure I'm clear. But what goes hand in hand is the foolish question with the person who's trying to cause division. You're going to see that a lot. The person who is the bad person, the person who's coming in to cause fights and cause arguments and, and split people up, they will have a lot of foolish questions that they're going to try to use to trip you up, to stump you, to try to shake your faith and overthrow your faith in, in the doctrines that are taught in the Bible. So they're going to come at you with some really, really dumb things. And they're going to try to make them not sound so dumb, but they're foolish. It's foolish questions. That's why we see these kind of group together is because that's one of the tactics that the people who are trying to cause division will do. So we're, we're avoiding and breaking fellowship with people who are trying to cause division, not just a person who happens to have a foolish question. But either way, we still try to avoid the foolish question because it's foolish and there's no value in it. So um, foolish only questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes, because that's just where arguments are going to come from anyways. Verse number 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. See, and this is telling us exactly the attitude we need to have. So we need to be humble and meek and try to help people out that are unlearned. Maybe they're new believers. Maybe they are asking some dumb questions. We want to avoid the foolish questions, but also try to help those people out and instruct them, be patient with them, show meekness. We're not on a hair trigger to just, you know, shun people and have nothing to do with them. Okay, just get, let's get the spirit of what's being taught in Scripture, but let's also make sure because what happens, and especially in today's day, is that people can get lopsided on being overly loving and giving too much time and investing too much on something where the Bible's telling us, no, you need to cut it off there and stop. Like the heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. That is a biblical teaching. That's not something that you need to just continually fall over yourself trying to get this person to, to listen to you. You don't waste your time. The Bible, God's teaching us that, you know, there's, there's plenty of other people who will listen, so don't waste your time on that one. Because it is a waste of time. So in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance, the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Uh, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, when to break fellowship with people. Well, another good example we're going to see in Matthew 18 is when someone's kicked out of the church. When someone's kicked out of the church, you don't continue to fellowship with that person if you're still in the church. 
even if you disagree with, with the decision that was made. You don't continue to support people who come in and try to supplant the church and cause division and, mar and make offenses. There has to be, and you know, if you're going to be coming to our church or to any good church, you have to have some level of trust in your pastor to make wise decisions. Because that's the reason why they're put in that position to begin with. Now, nobody is perfect. I'm not claiming to be perfect and that every single decision I ever make is always going to be perfect, is always going to be right. I'm not saying that, but I am the one that has the authority in the church that's given to me by God as the pastor to make decisions. And, you know, the, the role of a pastor is to shepherd and to watch over the flock. And the whole congregation is the flock and the pastor is the one who's tasked with making sure that wolves don't creep in. It's my job to be trained in this area to watch and be able to identify people who are wolves that are trying to creep in. That's my job. Now, everyone should be aware of that and know what's going on. But the pastor's job is literally to be watching out for that. So if there's someone who's coming in, causing divisions, needs to be kicked out of the church, you are going to cause further divisions by going and continuing to fellowship with people who have already been, you've been just kicked out and ousted and, and we should have nothing to do with them. Matthew 18 will cover this. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. So this is talking about someone, two people in church just having a dispute amongst themselves. But this is one example of church discipline. Verse number, uh, let's keep reading here. Verse number 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So the Bible is saying, let that man just be like some unsaved person out in the world. You don't you know, this isn't someone you're going to be spending all your, you know, your time with and being best friends with. Just let him be unto you like a heathen. But that's if they reject the church. They've gone through these channels. Now, this is one example, but this can also be applied to other people that are thrown out of the church, not necessarily because of some problem they had with another church member, but for other reasons, we're going to get to that here in a minute. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it gives us a list of people that we should not be fellowshipping with as well. And this gives us some very good examples of people who actually aren't welcome in church. I've been receiving emails this week, and just to let you know, I don't know if it's... if. if there's any extra motive behind this or not. But sodomites have been asking, oh, am I welcome at your church? Oh, I was just wondering how, how open and friendly you are with, with homos. Now, it could be that there just so happens to be people legitimately asking that question. But the majority of time, they're trying to trap you. They're trying to set you up. They're trying to, to catch you at your words. They're trying to cause problems. That's usually what happens to this. But... I'm always going to tell people because I'm not afraid or ashamed to say, no, you're not welcome. Right. And you know what? That's where this church stands. Homosexuals, sodomites, fags, dykes, lesbians, queers, whatever you want to call them, they're not welcome here. They hate God. And you can read Romans chapter 1. You can see what the Bible says about them. You can see in the New Testament how God has given Sodom and Gomorrah as an example to those that should after live ungodly of how God feels about it and what God does. God's law, the perfect law of God, puts a death penalty on homosexuality. Okay, And we are not going to allow perverts and pedophiles to come into our church to defile the church. Not going to happen. Not welcome. What we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 are other things where, and look, it's not just homos that aren't allowed in church. That's just a pretty obvious one.
there are other rules, if you will, that apply to the standard that we have within church and, and what we're going to tolerate and what we won't. So you're getting crammed down your throat that everyone's supposed to tolerate everything. Just all manner of wickedness. Just be tolerant. Tolerate everything. No. No. That's how the morality continues to decline and just get flushed down the toilet is because people just tolerate everything. Well, no, there's, there's a point where you've got to draw a line and say, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. We are going to have some standards. We're going to have some standards of how we live and when we gather together as a church family, what we're going to allow in here. And the standards are given to us in Scripture. I'm not even coming up with this stuff on my own and just saying, whoa, I just don't want this person to be here or that person to be here. No, we're going to follow what the Bible says. Look at verse number one. This is the Apostle Paul rebuking the church at Corinth. He's writing a letter to the church that's at Corinth. That's why it's called 1 Corinthians. It's his first letter to this church. Verse number one, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. He's saying this is not some secret. This isn't like he... he found out about this because one person knows about it. These, this is out in the open. This is just publicly in the church. Some guy has his father's wife he's committing fornication with. He's saying, even the unsaved world, that's what he's referring to when he talks about the Gentiles, even they think that that is just perverted, that's bizarre, that's taking it too far. Now, we live, that'll show you a little bit of the signs of the times that we're in. Because first of all, you know, even the mention of fornication in Scripture is a really bad thing. I mean, it's a really, really bad thing. The Bible says flee fornication, avoid it, have nothing to do with it. It's wicked, it's sinful, it, it's destructive to just have this relationship before people are married. And it's a very serious sin. It's a very serious sin that people for many years, and especially in this country, have always looked down upon, and it's never been acceptable. It's never been something that is, is a standard that you would just say, oh, okay, well, no big deal, until you get into the past 30, 40 years. Now, all of a sudden, you've got men and women living together, shacking up, not being married, living together for decades. Just move out, get a place to live, get a place to stay, start having kids, not get married. Or just go jumping around from boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, and just having relationships. That's what happens on the movies. That's what happens on the TV shows. That's what happens on, on every, all the media that's being pumped into your brain, that that's all normal. There's nothing wrong with it. You have nobody saying that's wicked as hell and that's a sin and no one should be doing that. And you're making God angry by, by committing such wickedness. You don't see that. They're going to tell you that everything's just fine. Oh, no, no, keep doing this. Keep having your abortions. Keep having your kids out of wedlock. Keep raising children in single-parent homes. Yeah, that's real good. So this church is very tolerant at Corinth. They have within their congregation some guy that has his father's wife that he's committing fornication with and everyone knows about it. And they may think they're tolerant and they're so loving and they're so open. Hey, everybody's welcome. But look what the Apostle Paul says to him. He says, and you are puffed up. You're proud. You're arrogant. Thinking that it's not a big deal to have someone like that in your congregation. He says, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already. Oh, yeah, you're being real judgmental, right? There's another slander that people want to use these days. Oh, stop judging. The boss of Paul saying, you know what? I don't even have to be there. I'm there in spirit, and I've judged already. So I don't need to hear any extra circumstances of this event. It's wicked, and that's his judgment, and his judgment's right, and it's righteous judgment. 
He says, I've judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Now, the argument against this is that people are going to say, oh, well, everybody's a sinner, right? Yeah, everyone is a sinner. But not everybody is having his father's wife. Okay, where are you going to draw the line? Well, the Bible draws a line for us. That, there's a very clear line for us right there. We're not talking about a sin that, you know, just some little sin, some sin. We're all sinners. You watch out for that. Because this is a big deal. And the Bible's saying, this guy needs to be delivered unto Satan. Now, people think they're being very loving and helpful when you tolerate all this sin. That's at least what's being taught. But you actually don't love the person when you're being really tolerant and over-loving when they're in wicked sin. They need to be told, hey, you're wrong. If you want your life to get better, you got to get out of that wickedness. Because I'll tell you what, it's just a, a lie out of hell to say that God's not going to judge somebody that's in that type of a situation. Of course he is. And if you love someone, you're going to tell them the truth. Whether or not the truth hurts, you tell them the truth. You don't lie to someone saying, oh, it's really not that big of a deal. But that's what people do today for money. That's what these big name preachers Oh, it doesn't matter if you're a Muslim or if you're an atheist, if you're whatever. That's what, oh, by the way, this is Billy Graham saying words like this. We all just, there's all just one God and everyone basically is going to be saved. And whatever path you choose, that's a path. Yeah, it sounds real good. It sounds real comforting. It sounds loving. But it's a lie. And if you tell people lies like that, they're going to go to hell. Because you need the truth. You need to hear the truth. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Now, as long as I'm bringing up salvation, let me just make this clear as well, because none of what I'm teaching tonight has anything to do with salvation. Salvation is a free gift. We're all sinners and deserve a punishment of hell. When you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved from that punishment. You're saved. You become a child of God. But the people that I'm referring to here, they may be saved or unsaved. Saved people can get into heresy. Saved people can get into fornication. Saved people can get into bad fornication. So it's not a matter of, is this person saved or not? It's a matter of, should we be keeping company with them or not? But what we're going to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is that there still is a difference of standard that you apply at church. Because there are things that you would expect in the world. Let's look at verse number, well, let's keep reading here. Verse number seven. Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So what he's saying here is that when I, he say, I already wrote to you not to keep company with fornicators. But he's explaining a little bit further what I meant by that. He's, he's saying, I'm not just saying, you know, all these different things that you can never have anything to do with anybody like that out in the world because then you'd need to just completely get out of the world and not have any interactions with anybody because of how wicked the world is. Because we know that that's what the world does. Now, they shouldn't be your best friends, fornicators, extortioners, covetous, saved or unsaved. But he's going to clarify that. And let's keep reading here because you're going to get the clarity in just a minute. He says in verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous 
or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. So this is talking about someone who's saved and is called a brother. Now, I think it's important that the Bible uses that phrase there, called a brother. Because in church, you're going to have people that will come to church as new believers. Oh, I mean, if we're doing our job, we're going to be getting converts, people putting their faith in Jesus Christ. And at the moment that the person gets saved, they are a baby, a babe in Christ. They're in, they've experienced a new birth. They're born again. But it's going to take a lot of effort and work to get, certain, you know, to get sins out of their life and to start to grow and, and to become more spiritually sound and knowledgeable. Now, when you come to a Baptist church, at least, you come to our church, you, you might hear someone say, hey, brother so-and-so, brother Evan, brother John, brother Miller. You got people, who, they're known as brothers. Why? Because they, they've been saved for a little while. They've been saved long enough and have read the Bible and have come to church long enough to know your basic right from wrong. I'm not saying they only know the basics. What I'm saying is that when people have been coming, you understand, you've heard this, you're going to be referred to as brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. That's just, just the terminology that we use. But it's not always the same as someone who just gets saved. See, if someone just gets saved and you don't realize fornication's wrong, drunkenness is wrong, all these different sins, you have to hear it first in order to get growth. So we're not just going to shun people from the church that just gets saved and needs to hear these things in order to grow. But if someone has already heard this and already knows this and they're saved and they've been saved for a little bit of time, then these are the people that know. And this is the list. This is the standard that God gives. He says not to keep company. If any man is called a brother, be a fornicator. Why? Because it's a very serious sin. It's very serious. Covetous. Always wanting things that, that you can't have or that aren't yours. Just wanting all the you know, material possessions or the possessions of others or other people's wives or girlfriends or whatever. Just wanting things that other people have that you can't have. That's covetousness. And that's a sin. And it's actually a very wicked sin. It's a very bad sin. It's bad enough where the Bible says, you know what, don't even, have, don't even go out to eat with that person if that's what they're like. Or a railer. Someone who just makes railing accusations against people, just unfounded, just, just railing on people. A drunkard. I don't have to explain that one. An extortioner. Look, these are all serious sins. Now, is it saying that you have to be perfect in order to come to church? No. But it is highlighting and listing some things that the Bible deems to be very serious and says, you know what, here's a standard. And here's a standard of what ought to be in church. If you have people that are called a brother, then and calling someone a brother, that means that's implying that they're saved, right? And the Bible's not saying, oh, if, if, if you have a brother that's one of these things, they're not saved. No, that's not what it says. It says, if you have a brother that's committing these things, then you need to shun them. You need to have nothing to do with them. You don't even eat with them. Why? Because it's called tough love. Because oftentimes, people don't get the point. They might hear preaching, and it goes in one ear and out the other, and they need to just get to the point to where they're kind of you know, hitting rock bottom, if you will, like, wow. Maybe this is a bigger deal than I thought because what happens is people often want to justify their own sin in their head. And in their mind, they think it's not that really big of a deal because there's all these explanations as to why this is not a problem. But it really is a big problem. And when people start to shun them, then they might realize, okay, well, maybe I need to do something about this and correct this. It actually, it actually is a loving thing to do. If you really care about that person, you're not going to continue to enable them to, to sin and to do wickedness. And at the end of the day, we need to be right with God. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And put that person away from you. And he's saying, we are supposed to judge within the church. We absolutely are supposed to judge. 
Don't, don't get caught up in this nonsense of people saying, oh, judge not, judge not, and they just know two words. Couldn't even tell you what verse that comes from, let alone what the rest of the verse actually says in Matthew chapter 7. They just like hearing, oh, I've heard this before, judge not, oh, we're not supposed to judge, judge not. Yeah, you can't judge anybody, so judge not. How many times now in just the few verses that we've been reading is the Apostle Paul saying, look, I've judged already. I haven't even been there and I judge. And he's saying, don't you judge those that are within? God judges those that are without. Hey, in the church, you need to be judging. And if you read Matthew 7 in context, it's talking about being a hypocrite when you judge. So yeah, if you're going to judge someone, be like, oh, I'm going to shun you because you're a fornicator and you're involved in fornication. That's where the Bible's saying not to judge because you're guilty of the same exact thing and you're a total hypocrite when you do it. But if you are not guilty of these things, and yeah, you may not be perfect, but you've already cleaned up this stuff or you've never gotten involved with it to begin with, and this is not a problem, you're not involved in this sin, then yes, you can judge. And yes, we ought to judge in church because there needs to be a state. Because what is it going to say? What does it say to the kids when you allow all manner of wickedness to be going on in the house of God? What does that teach them? I'll tell you one thing, you know, kids learn by example way more than they learn by words. You want to teach your kids something at home? The do as I say, not as I do doesn't work. It's going to go in one ear and out the other because they're going to hear you say one thing. And any parent knows this. They can hear you say, you may know what's right, but you have your own problems and you do things that are wrong. They're going to pick up on that. And instead of necessarily just listening to you say that's wrong, if they see you doing it, they're going to think, well, it can't be that bad. And you have kids in church and they hear the pastor screaming against fornication and against adultery and against wickedness. But then they see, oh, well, these people are living together and these people, you know, must not be that big of a deal. Then that's how they're going to grow up. That's how they're going to learn. And that's what they're going to go off and do. There needs to be standards. And I don't even think these are very difficult standards. It's just that these days, these sins are taught to be not that big of a deal by the world and by a lot of churches. You're not hearing this stuff anymore and just contributes, contributes to, the, to the moral decay. Turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, real quick. I'm going to try to get through these last few points that I have. Break fellowship with the heretics. Break fellowship with those that are already kicked out of a church. Don't have fellowship with those people that are, especially when they're kicked out for, you know, biblical reasons. They're causing problems. They're causing divisions. They're heretics. Don't have anything to do with those people. Don't be their friends online. Don't be their friends in secret. Now, if a person repents and gets right with God, then yes, we do embrace them and we do accept them. And we're, we're totally willing to forgive. Absolutely. This isn't something that's an e like an eternal thing. Like, oh, well, you did something wrong here. You're kicked out. We never want to see you again. No, we want to see you get right. And if, and if anyone ever is kicked out of this church for one of the reasons we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, they need to be kicked out. And you need to not have anything to do with them and, and not go out to eat with them. But if they come back humble and they've gotten that right, then we don't hold grudges. We don't hold anything over their heads. We accept them as if nothing happened. And just say, well, come back in. And we'd love to have you here. And welcome back, brother. Because that's what we want. That's what you ought to want. It's not, we're not out to get people. It's not, the, you know, it's not the attitude we ought to have. It's just trying to bring people down. But we do have a standard that needs to be maintained. And it's important. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication... And all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. 
So again, we see the same things that were listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 listed here. Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Don't even let that be named among you. That should have nothing to do with you. You should, you should, <coughs> you should be beyond that. Verse number 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. And here's where the heretics come in. They're vain, meaningless words, trying to deceive you, trying to make you think that it's not really that big of a deal. Oh, you need to just welcome everybody in and accept all this, this wickedness. No. So for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. There were prophets in the day of, uh, 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 false prophets in the day of Jeremiah the prophet. You know, Jeremiah is preaching doom and gloom and saying, hey, God's judgment's coming. God's going to come. He's going to take us captive. He's going to destroy the land. We need to get right with God. And what did all the other prophets of the time say? Oh, no, God is for us. No, we're the people of God. We're doing the right thing. We are right with God the whole time. And they proclaimed peace. Peace. The Bible says when there is no peace. There was no peace because God's going to bring judgment on them. But they said that there's peace. There's always going to be false prophets that are going to lie to you and try to tell you things that are going to make you sound good and make you feel a little better. And you can go home and just continue a filthy, wicked lifestyle, fornicating, being covetous, doing whatever your wicked heart desires. And you're going to go in and you'll hear someone lie to you to make you feel good, to prop you up for another week and keep on going. And the person actually hates you because they're not telling you the truth. And if God's going to come and rain down judgment upon you, I'd rather know about that so I could get right with them than just be kept ignorant of it and just continue down into that uh, cesspool of destruction. Let's read verse 6 again. He says, Let no man deceive you. The people out there to trick you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. So, being not partakers means you have nothing to do with them. People to avoid. Again, it's, but it's the same list. The fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship. So you're breaking fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Tell them they're wrong. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to see another example. And this one, I don't know if I've heard this preached before, specifically, at least in this way, but it's actually very clear in Scripture. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So under the inspiration of, let's get this, in the scripture, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, a commandment coming forward in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what we're reading here, just so you know. This is a commandment under the authority of Jesus Christ in God's holy word to the brethren. That ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Now, we're going to see in the context of this chapter what it means by disorderly and what it means by the tradition that you have received. And I'm going to tell you right now what that is. When they're walking disorderly, it was people who were not working. Men that were not working to provide for themselves, to provide for their families, and he says, you didn't receive the tradition which you've received. Well, the reason why he says you haven't received your tradition is because the Apostle Paul is known for, when you read this whole passage in context, he worked hard day and night supporting his own needs, supporting himself, and doing the work of the Lord. Doing both. 
and showing the people that you can work very hard and you should do this work and not be slack and supply your own needs. And don't rely on other people to take care of you. So the people who are walking disorderly, they're moochers. They're asking for the handouts. They're not willing to work themselves and they're busybodies and they're getting involved in everyone else's business instead of keeping themselves busy doing their own work and supporting themselves. Let's get that from the context. Verse number seven, the Bible says, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. So he's going to explain now what he means by saying these people are disorderly, but we were not disorderly, right? We did not behave ourselves disorderly among you. Verse number eight, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. Naught means nothing. Hey, we didn't eat it. We didn't take anything from anybody and just eating someone else's bread for free. If we ate someone else's bread, we paid them for it. He says, but wrought, that means worked with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, and I covered this last week, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. This is the tradition he's trying to leave with them. He's saying, because he is a man of God, because he's an evangelist, because he's doing the work of the Lord, he's entitled to actually receive benefit of being provided food to do the work that he's doing. It's totally reasonable for that to happen. He's saying, but I didn't take that because we're trying to be an example for you that you can do these things and work and work for yourself. I'm working for myself. You work for yourself. And you know what? It should anger people when some fully able-bodied man comes up to you and asks you for money when you've been working all week. Right. Say, I've got a family. I've got to feed myself. I'm going off to work. You can get a job. You can work, but you're lazy and you're just asking for a handout. Get to work. Now, that's different from people who can't work. There are people who are disabled you know, they can't work. Maybe they have no legs, right? Something that, that's going to prevent someone from working. That's not who we're talking about. We're talking about people who are fully capable of doing work and don't do it. And not people who make up phony reasons as to why they can't work. Because everyone's going to have an excuse as to why they can't work. Everybody does. You live in this country, I don't care who you are, you could find work. It may not be the best job. It may be doing some, some nasty stuff or whatever, right? Dealing with digging ditches or getting into to, you know, sewage systems or whatever, right? Jobs are not desirable. But if you're willing to work, you can find work. Verse number 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you. So again, the commandment. That if any would not work, neither should he eat. This was a commandment the Apostle Paul said. Look, if you're not going to work, then you're not going to eat. No, I'm not going to give you any food. Get to work. Work for yourself. Provide for yourself. We live in a snowflake society of, of raising up kids that are just going to be dependent, sucking at the teat of the government, saying, oh, I need help. Oh, I can't find work. Oh, I don't want to do this. Oh, I deserve to have this minimum wage. Oh, you should be paying me $15 an hour to flip a cheeseburger. You're not entitled to that. Get to work, you lazy bum. Get out there and make your own way. Have some standards. Show some respect. Other people did it. Your grandfathers did it. Your fathers did it. Go out there and get to work. Don't rely on other people to give you a handout. Verse number 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. So again, the context of being disorderly is talking about people who are not working because they're orderly, they're working. And he's the example. And he's saying they're disorderly. And he says right here, they walk among you disorderly, working not at all. That's the context. They're not working, but are busybodies. What's a busybody? They're not working, but they are busy about something. They're getting into everyone else's business. Talking. You get some vain talking, a lot of vain talking going on from people who don't work. They got nothing else to do. Oh, well, these days it's going to be, right? Internet. Internet trolls commenting on YouTube, on Facebook, and 
They're not working, but man, they've got all the time in the world to spend being a busybody. You know how much time I spend on Facebook and on YouTube a day? It is very, very, very little. You know why? Because I'm working. Now, I don't care what you choose to do with your free time. I don't. You want to choose, you know, spend your free time on those sites, have at it. But if you're not working, get off of being a busybody and find a job and get to work. Bible says in verse number 12 here, now them that are such, these disorderly people working not at all, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, mark that person, and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yes, that's what the Bible says. When you got a man that's able-bodied and not working, and he's a busybody, that you don't have anything to do with that guy, and you shun him, that he might be ashamed of himself and actually get himself up and get to work. Because that's what he's supposed to do. You don't coddle him. Oh, it's okay, little Stevie. It's okay, little Junior. You don't have to work. We'll give you some. We'll, we'll, we'll feed you. Get to work. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. But look at verse number 15. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. This is for the brethren. They're not your enemy. Now you say, oh, but you were just speaking really harshly about this. Yeah, it is harsh. Yes, it is. But the harshness is used Believe it or not, out of love. Yes, it is good sometimes to be ashamed of yourself if you are ashamed. <laughs> hey, I've been ashamed of things that I've done in the past. And it's good if you get a godly sorrow that worketh repentance and amen. When you're in sin, when you're doing things you're not supposed to do, you ought to be ashamed of yourself and you ought to hear it and have it called out. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. It's not okay. But the reason why I need to hear it is so that you can get right. So you start doing the right thing, then you're, not, you're, not, you're never an enemy, but now you're not going to be shunned. You're not going to be you know, ridiculed or ousted when you're doing what's right. And it's not every little thing, but it's the things that the Bible says. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now turn really quickly to Isaiah 65 because I want to make sure I get this covered before I finish up and close up this sermon because you're going to hear, you need the balance. The balance of the hard preaching on the sin and that it doesn't get um, missed about how <laughs> important these things are in Scripture. That these are serious things. That being a fornicator, being a whoremonger, being covetous, you know, all these things that we're seeing being listed off, these are big deals. It's a big sin. Okay? And, and you're going to hear a lot of hard preaching against it, but at the same time, as a whole, we all need to have the right attitude through the whole thing. Yes, it's going to be condemned. It's going to be, you know, preached hard on. But at the same time, we need to have the proper attitude of not just coming across as a total holier-than-thou type of person where we're actually lifting ourselves up and thinking that you're better than other people. I'm not better than a person and a brother caught in a sin. I'm not better than them. And I'm not going to think of myself as being better than them. But I love that person and I want them to get help. And I want them to stop doing what they're doing because I care about them. And I know that God's going to bring judgment on them. So I'm going to do things God's way. 
and I'm going to try to, you know, as humbly as possible, but as sternly as possible, tell someone something that they don't like. It's kind of like when you, when you go out and preach the gospel to people, you got to tell them that, that they deserve hell as a punishment. Now, there's, there's only so many ways you can say that, and there's only so much of a nice way you can say that. You try to be tactful. You try not to, and, and again, another situation, you don't want to come off as this holier than now. Oh, you're so wicked and I'm so good. No, that's not what we're saying. But when you're preaching the gospel, it's you are wicked because God's going to send you to hell if you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ. And that's just a fact. I was headed for hell too, but I received a free gift. I'm not better, I'm not better than you. I've just received this gift. This is an attitude that the children of Israel had in Isaiah. If you're in Isaiah 65, they had this attitude of just having this holier than now. That's where the that's where actually literally where the phrase comes from, holier than now. You hear people say it all the time. It comes from Isaiah 65. It comes from the Bible. It's funny how many people that, that don't like Christianity and don't like the Bible will, will use the phrase that comes directly from the Bible. But in verse number 2 there, uh, Isaiah 65, the Bible says, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good, after their own thoughts, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh, and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. So these people, they're not obeying God's laws. They're not doing any of it. They, they're provoking God to anger. They're doing all these things he told them not to do. That's the type of people we're talking about. Verse number five, it says, which say. So these people say, stand by thyself. Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. They thought they were really righteous and really spiritual and really religious and they were really puffed up thinking that they're better than everyone else when in fact they were really wicked and not doing what they were supposed to be doing. That's this holier-than-thou attitude that says, oh, you, you don't even come close to me. It's a holier-than-thou attitude that people had towards Jesus Christ when the woman came weeping at his feet and was crying and using her tears to wash his feet and her hair to wash his feet and they're like they couldn't believe that Jesus would allow that to happen they're like don't you know what type of person that is they had the holier than now attitude now there should be no confusion about this you still preach what's true and what's right but you don't have a, a condescending attitude or thinking of yourself, well, I'm just better than these people so I can't even talk to them or have anything to do with them. That's the holier-than-thou attitude. We go out every week, almost every day as a church as a whole in general, there's people going out almost every single day to reach people where they're at and knock on their doors and go to their homes and try to tell them about Jesus Christ and the love that he has for them. We don't go there to judge everything that they're doing wrong. We don't go to their house to tell them all these areas where they're wrong about. We go there trying to show them how to be saved. And it takes humility to do that, and it takes love to go out and do that. But when people who are saved then come to church, you're coming here to hopefully grow and to learn more and to hear things that maybe you hadn't heard before and see things that maybe you hadn't seen before out of God's word so you can grow and become even a better, stronger Christian. So you're going to hear things that are preached on that are going to sound a little hard. They might sound a little harsh. But anybody that knows me knows that I'm not trying to drive people away. I don't have this, this I'm better than you type of an attitude. I'm going to be right there with you. I love everybody here. I'm, I'll do my best to help you out in situations, but I'm going to try to help people the way that God says to do it and not think that my ways are better than God's ways. If God says this is the way you handle with this situation, how can I improve on what God said? I can't. So this is the way we do things here. We go to Scripture for it. 
Galatians chapter 6. So we'll do, read these last couple of verses and we're done. Galatians chapter 6, just verses 1 and 2 of Galatians chapter 6. With all the hard preaching, we definitely need the balance. I've seen it happen from time to time where people get really zealous because they love the hard preaching. Man, I love, I love when you say this. I love when you say that. And it's just, you know, people get excited about that. Not everybody does, but some people, they just kind of, they, they just really love to hear just the, the hardest that you can hear someone preach on whatever. They just love to hear it. But sometimes people can take that a little bit too far and forget just the, the overall spirit and the purpose of it, right? And get caught up in having an overjudgmental type of an attitude. And Galatians chapter 6 will help to bring us down to earth as well or just keep us balanced in the mentality we ought to have. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We, have, we should have a spirit of restoration. We want people to get right with God. Now, if they're not going to get right with God, there are things that we need to follow and say, okay, well, you know, with these certain sins, if that's what's going on in your life and you're not, you don't want to get right with God, then I'm not going to have anything to do with you. Because even in that verse, it says you need to consider yourself that you're not also tempted. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. I need to make sure that I'm not going to get so um, conditioned that this really isn't that big of a deal by being around this person and, and just allowing everything to happen as normal because that'll make you think it's not that big of a deal after a while. I'm going to do this act of saying, no, I can't have anything to do with you until you get right with God. But the whole point of doing that is that that person does come around. You're guarding yourself as well as want, you're doing the best thing you can do for that person to, to, to realize their error and to get right with God. So there's multiple examples in Scripture of, of when we ought to be breaking fellowship and saying, nope, that's enough. And these are most of the places. I'm not saying that's necessarily even all of the places in Scripture, but it's the basic overall theme that you can see of, uh, of how we practice this and what we do. And... Um, Hopefully that helps you. Let's bow right now a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instruction that you give us in your word. Lord, help us to apply um, these truths appropriately and that we would be able to um, make these decisions or it, when necessary, Lord, that we would be able to, um, to follow the, this, these commands that were given of having, having no fellowship with and not even everything to eat with people that fit this criteria, Lord. It's not always an easy thing to do. It's an uncomfortable thing to do. It's not anything anyone enjoys doing. But help us to do what's right for the benefit, overall, the benefit of the person that's, that's ensnared and caught in the trap of the devil, dear Lord. Help us to just do what's right and to be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.